Welcome to the Integrated Schools Podcast. I'm Andrew, a white dad from Denver. And I'm Val, a black mom from North Carolina. And this is Language, Power, and Whiteness. I can already see how those things are connected. Talk to us a little bit about our guest. Yes, so we have another return guest, JPB Gerald. Folks may remember, in the middle of the pandemic, we talked to him about about all sorts of things, because that's what you get when you talk to JPB Gerald, Um, but particularly about the connection between language and whiteness. I think the way it connected in my mind is that I know that I've had to use language in order to access different places in my life, right? Mm. Uh, Code switching would be part of that. Mm -hmm. And so I recognize there's, there's power in being able to navigate that. And I think I also recognized how language can be used to disempower others. Yes. And so JPB Gerald has has lots of thoughts on that and has has been thinking and writing about that for a while. He is a black neurodivergent language scholar, started out his career as a, a language teacher. If if people want his full bio, we got much more into it in his first episode on the show. But sort of the, the broad strokes, he grew up in very white spaces, you know, sort of elite private schools, and then ended up going and teaching English as a second language. Starting out in Korea, he had no training at all. But because mm-hmm. he spoke quote unquote, proper English, he was allowed to go and teach Koreans how to speak English. So so he's at quite different experiences, I think, from lots of folks. And his perspective on that provided him a lot of insight that he used in his doctoral research and as he continued as an educator. Yes. And his graduate research that led to his doctorate degree also spawned a book that recently came out called Antisocial Language Teaching, English and the Pervasive Pathology of Whiteness, where he really explores this connection between whiteness, language, standard, or what he refers to the standardized English, and mm-hmm. then this sort of new thread in his life, which is uh, disability, because he has recently been diagnosed as neurodivergent. Yeah. And I think one of the things that he wanted to convey was this book was not just for English teachers or literacy teachers. He wanted other people to understand how all of these things intersect as well. For sure. And and the book definitely reads that way. You do not have to be a language scholar to uh, get something out of the book. It was a fascinating read and encourage readers to check it out. And I think after you hear the conversation, you will want to. All right. Let's hear from the man. All right. Uh, hi, folks. I'm JPB Gerald, EDD, so I guess Dr. JPB Gerald. Um, I graduated this spring from Hunter College or CUNY. Um, my degree is in instructional leadership, which, what does that even mean? <laughs> um, but what I'm choosing to do with my degree is I work as a training manager for a nonprofit. And you also wrote a book called Antisocial Language Teaching, English and the Pervasive Pathology of Whiteness. The last time we had you on, we were talking about the links between language instruction and whiteness, but we certainly didn't get into it in depth the way you do in the book. So what's the book about and why'd you write it? You know, it's funny. The last time I was on here, I was talking about a couple of articles I wrote, and um, one of them had come out that was about whiteness and language teaching. And for those who haven't heard the episode, the point I'm making is that what is prized in an ideal language speaker, particularly English, but it's not untrue in other languages, aligns with what we prize in uh, this sort of constructed white identity. So that was the kernel of the idea from a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And then I gave a talk about that article, and... And then I wrote a summary of it. In academia, they ask you to do weird things. Um, <laughs> and the a publisher, she read the summary. <laughs> and then she said that they wanted to, to publish my work. And then I said, okay. And the only thing I could really think to do was sort of expand on ideas that were in that article mm-hmm. and combine it with the additional knowledge I had gained about disability in the time uh, I'd been researching since then. Yeah, talk talk a bit about the disability piece. We didn't really talk about disability at all. The last time you were on, it feels like that's been sort of a new uh, a new part of your journey. How did that come to be, and and how do you think about that? Yeah, so in 2017 or so, I had started to 
think that I might be neurodivergent in some way, um, but I wasn't diagnosed and it lined up with various symptoms and so forth. And I had a, you know, a therapist and we sort of agreed, but that was not a diagnosis. And I said to myself, well, I think that this is true. I'm going to see about getting a diagnosis in a few months. I'm about to have a son. Let me just worry about that in a few months. And if you remember from the last time I was on, my son was born in February of 2020. Right. So, you know, things were going to be a couple of months later. It was not, it was not going to happen. There wasn't much going Uh, on. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, I just didn't think about it for a while, but at the same time, like what I could learn that was new in school was mostly tied to the intersection between ableism and racism. Right. You know, it's in the book, it's in other books, but you know, the way we think of disability in the United States uh, really did emerge from the way we came out of slavery. Yeah, that, that's a big idea. And we definitely need to come back and unpack that a bit. But, mm-hmm. you know, to set a bit more context, you you were working on this in 2020 during the pandemic and in the wake of George Floyd's murder when, when there was all sorts of conversations about race going on. There's a lot of people, especially in 2020, just talking about race, not all necessarily doing a great job at it. But... I thought that there was something new I could say by talking not just about race, but also about language, because that's what my background is is professionally, but then also bringing in the connection with disability, because I don't think that intersection has really been made. Yep. One of the things I I love about the book is this this kind of like self-reflection that that goes throughout mm. it. I feel like you've done a lot of like, you know, kind of examining your yourself and your own story and your own history. And there's like a lot of acknowledging places where you were wrong in the past. And you open the book with this Baldwin quote, please try to remember that what they believe as well as what they do and cause you to endure does not testify to your inferiority, but to their inhumanity and fear. And I I can see why, as you then go and sort of like tell your own story, why that quote opens the book. I'm wondering if you can sort of tell us about that and and a little bit of your your background and history. I mean, I could tell the story of the entire book if you ask me that question. <laughs> um, so for a long time, like a very long time, for decades even, um, most of the people I had grown up around, and I'm excluding my family from this, were white because of the schools I went to, you know, and I went to the same school for like 14 years growing up. And then I went to, a, you know, exclusive college and I started to think more about these things at that time. It's not, look, everyone thinks about racism when they're younger. I should say a lot. You know, black people have to think about it. But I wasn't thinking about it from the people directly in front of me. It was more distant. I didn't think about it in the what we would call like microaggression way, you know. Mm-hmm. And even as an adult, things would happen that, you know, because it wasn't, I don't want to say overt, but uh, explicit. My brain always wanted to put it on something else Mm. because it's easier to deal with. Absolutely. You know, so I always want to be like, well, this hateful, weird thing that happened is because of whatever. And a lot of the time you blame yourself, Mm -hmm. which is why that quote is there. When this more interpersonal things happen, you know, it's just much easier to to be like, well, you know, I guess I was just annoying them. So, you know, I'll, I'll try to do things better next time so that doesn't happen. Mm. And by the time I got to a certain point, I realized that that was untrue. And I had a child and I realized I needed to teach him something different. Mm. I think that last phrase, you know, connects us all here as a group of parents who are trying to figure out what's best for our young people. So as a caregiver, parent community, what are some main takeaways you would want the readers to know? Well, it's it's funny because at the time that the publisher was interested, I was like, I also have to write a dissertation. Like, how am I going to write a book and a dissertation at the same time? This is ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and I said, maybe they'll let me write the book as the dissertation. They, did, they didn't let me do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I had, so I had to write two giant projects at the same time, right? Well, I was working full time and I had a kid and all this, you know, and obviously, you know, my wife did a lot of work because there were things I couldn't do. But like I was not an an uninvolved parent at all, you know, and the lesson I was learning from writing this and the dissertation at the same time was research I was gaining while doing the dissertation about how the people I was interviewing for that. They realized that in order to actually challenge racism, they had to really live it, which obviously is the point of the show. We were talking about their workplaces. They were educators and we were talking about their schools, right? And they 
were thinking about, you know, changing a policy in school or something like that. But then they would go home and when they had really sort of, quote unquote, gotten it, like they, they couldn't turn it off, you know, in their interactions with people just in the street, mm-hmm. you know, noticing things that they hadn't noticed before. All of these people in my classes uh, that I was teaching on this told me that they these were like usually progressive people who mm-hmm. were very like, hey, you know, you know, we, we absolutely should have equality. They said they hadn't considered their role in this and what they have mm-hmm. to do all of the time until they were 25, 30, 35. And Mm -hmm. I think for them, they realized that they wanted to have their children in a different world and have their children be different from a lot of what's around Mm -hmm. the world. So I would say the lessons that I learned from what I was doing, the research I was doing, and from the classes I was teaching and the people that I was just hearing from uh, showed that, you know, for parents, the decisions you make for your children are not divorced from these issues. Mm -hmm. And you really have to think about all of the ways that the the big and small decisions that you're making will impact your children and the way they see the world. When people grow up in a place that's homogenous, they just think that that is normal. And you don't even have to teach them that lesson. You don't have to sit down and say, this is, you know, you must have only this kind of people around. It doesn't have to be like that. But if that's all they see, they just think that that's what life is. Right. And then the only way they see us is on the TV and then how are we depicted mm-hmm. and, so, and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's so much in the book. I mean, the, the book is ostensibly about teaching English, but I feel like the first half of it is really about whiteness and blackness and sort of the construction of whiteness and the construction of blackness. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about ways that blackness gets constructed by whiteness. Yeah. So, I mean, when I say black people have existed longer than what we think of as blackness, I just mean, you know, if you had the ability to take a picture from 4,000, 5,000 years ago, you'd be able to come back with some pictures of people that we would now see uh, as black. You know, since there have been people, there have been some black people. (laughs) Right. But... It coalescing into this otherworldly, distant idea of being away from the norm took time. Mm. And historians will argue about this, so I'm not going to put a year on it. (laughs) But, like, there are many arguments about exactly when what we modern folks might recognize as Blackness was sort of more crystallized. But the historical record on whiteness shows that like that actually had to be thought of you know these people who are far away from us are different and weird thing is unfortunately not unique to the idea of blackness or whatever That, that all of the particular traits that we got piled on us that sort of rose alongside what was what traits were associated with whiteness yeah it's making me think of all of the court cases that had to establish whiteness, right? Right. Like, yeah. Oh, you're not white, but you're white, yeah. you know, all of those. So it was very much intentional about how we craft out this particular identity. And who gets to be white, right? Right. 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 Like first you're Italian, you're definitely not white. Now you're like, oh yeah, okay, you can be white now. Cool. Uh, Irish, no. All right. Jews, definitely not white. Okay, come on. I had a, I did an interview with a, a, a Finnish woman. And we were talking about how at a certain point, even Finnish people weren't really considered white, right? And you, you and I are thinking, like, what? It doesn't get any whiter, right? To, uh, what, <laughs> to, right? Yeah. Whiteness expands, but it's, 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 all, it's got these barriers that are always porous but harsh, right. you know? Because there's always people finding their way in. Right. But, you know, that line is still... still uh, Treacherous, I guess. I mean, I love that. I love that in the book you talk about it as a pyramid scheme. Yeah. And can, can you can you sort of walk us through that because it it was a yeah it sort of crystallized something for me for sure. Yeah, I was like, ooh, sassy. The pyramid scheme. I think I don't know if I was watching a TV show or something like that where I was just thinking about how there's this relentless cheer, cheerfulness that goes into a lot of like sort of MLM pyramid scheme stuff, right? They can't really admit that they spent all their money and they're losing all their money Mm -hmm. because that goes against the the job. You can't sell anything if you're desperate. Right. And then I started thinking about the whole downline thing and, uh, you know, that like there is a point in many pyramid schemes lives that they start with a product. Like there is a product in first place. Right. But then 
at a certain point, it turns over into you're actually making more of your money by having people below you. Right. And so I was thinking about that, about how like at a certain point, it's not even getting higher. It's them getting lower. I read it and, um, you know, I've watched enough of those documentaries because they're fascinating. I'm like, how did you fall for that? <laughs> and I, I think that's the same question, you know, that Andrew and I would talk about. Like, how do people fall for this knowing that it's a sham, it's not healthy, it's hurting everybody, and people are still signing up? And so, you know, now I'm like, I need to go watch another one of those documentaries and, and make some connections to whiteness because just from my vantage point, I always thought those folks needed a sense of community. And that's where they were looking for it. But that's actually a good point, which this is not in the book, but, you know, supplement here. (laughs) Uh, They're looking for a community, but it's a community that's based on something that's not real. So they do find what it resembles a community, but they're still on a work trip. Right. Or, like, <laughs> right. Right. It may right. right. It may be on a cruise boat, but it's still a work trip. Well, yeah. Right. Still like selling leggings or whatever it is. <laughs> so what I was thinking about. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I'm not talking about specific ethnicities that are often placed within whiteness, like Italians, Greeks, or whatever. I'm saying, but just when it is just the white part that is the community, it's just like the. So then what is it that you actually have in common besides that you're not these other people? Right. Right. It's fascinating. This idea that kind of the construction of whiteness, uh, you know, I've, I've come across that in the past. The piece that did feel sort of new to me was this disability piece. And you talk about kind of race and disability being constructed alongside of each other. Um, and we, we hinted at it a little bit earlier. But I wonder if we can go a little deeper and you can sort of explain how how that shows up, what that looks like in terms of the construction of and you talk about like ordered and disordered or ability and disability. Yeah. I feel like I'm doing my comprehensive exam. Here. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you already got the letters. You're good. <laughs> um, I mean, so I sort of, I mentioned it briefly and I said we would come back to it. So here we are. Um, you know, like obviously there've always been people who we would recognize as having some sort of impairment, people born with missing a leg or, something you know that's obviously always been true to some extent and every society dealt with different groups of people differently but in more recent society like native americans if something happened they found a way for you to be involved in the community in some capacity right and that was basically the case in early like America before the revolution, but everything industrialized. And then it was like, well, now you can't work. And now, now you're, you're of no value. Yeah. Right. Right. So like, it's not, it's those things. And also obviously capitalism is involved here. Right. So it's not just that if you want the whole thing, you read the book, but that's the short version. So of course the industrialization is happening and slavery is ending. And now all of these people, we, we don't know what to do with them. We still don't really know what to do with them, but we really didn't know what to do with them at that point. If they would do something that we would see as perfectly rational, like trying to flee or talking back to somebody or something like that, we we diagnosed them as mentally ill. And then often they came out of slavery physically impaired because they had been enslaved. And then, of course, civil war happens and a lot of people coming out of there and they need help. So all these things are happening at the same time. And these people can't, quote unquote, can't work. And... They all sort of get slid into an underclass in the way that the society views people. And then when you look at, to tie it to the sort of whole idea of the book, the language that's used in diagnosing people and language that's used by the people who have the power to write these diagnoses out, you see how groups of people can be overclassified into categories of disorder. And then when you think about the fact that, like, the police were created to keep order, then you see how people being classified as not fitting within the order becomes a problem to be dealt with. And it justifies all manner of things that we do to people who we don't find to be worthwhile. So that's the short answer to that question, which was not that short. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm I'm having a mind blowing moment right now because I had never thought about, and it makes complete sense, obviously, I never thought about every Black enslaved person who emerged from slavery having a disability 
as a result of all of that. Like, you know, the mental strain, but additionally, like the physical toll of enslavement on a person's body. And so to think that everyone who survived and came out of that could actually be labeled as disabled today, make like, it's my first time even considering that as a possibility, right? And how we didn't have the structure to support not only Black people, but millions of disabled people as well. Yeah, even if, you know, you're on plantation for like six months, something could have happened to you. Correct. Right? Like you're not okay after six months, you know? Right. So certainly... Right. And, and even just being there, if Correct. you're aware of the fact that you are not free to go. Correct. Yeah, I, I just, I never, I never thought about the scope of that and our inability to do anything structurally, nationally to support folks in that way and how that would make such a significant impact just on education, <laughs> let alone everything yeah. else, right? Our lack of desire, right? I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's huge. actually an inability. Were we, were we to want right. to, we probably could do something about that, but yeah. Yeah. But no, yeah, there's a way in which it then becomes a justification. You know, you talk a lot in the book about this kind of, and I think we talked about it last time too, that, that, you know, people don't want to tie themselves to things that feel like morally wrong. And so you look at a population of people exiting the institution of slavery, all with, you know, some collective trauma with, you know, these challenges. The only way to not be kind of consumed with guilt about that is to dehumanize. Right. And so, so it does, it does make that easier in my mind, at least to see the connection between whiteness and ability or blackness and disability that, you know, all these ways that we try to dehumanize people to justify the ways that if we need a hierarchy of people, which, you know, I think there, there are plenty of ways to imagine a society that doesn't need that. But if you have a, an extractive capitalistic society that requires hierarchy to put somebody on the bottom, you have to dehumanize them in some way. And this is a, a tool for that. If you have empathy for people with less than you, then the society can't continue as it it's right. I mean, not an individual person, but like if the group of people has empathy for the people with less than them, then society can't continue because that's too many people who see that there's an issue. Right. Things will, will have to change at that point. Revolution. Um, yeah, exactly. Something, so, yeah. <laughs> something because yeah. we all make small compromises here and there. Right. But I would prefer not to have a car, but like it just became more convenient when we had the kid and all that. So I was like, ah, I hate that thing. Not the kid, the car. Um, <laughs> That's good. a good clarification. <laughs> but when things get a little bit larger, even then people sort of make calculations so that they can live with themselves. And I think that when the sort of master narrative, the, the story we're all being told at the same time, tells you that the way you're living is okay, it's a lot easier to just listen to it than mm. to... What now you're going to step out from that, which is what people who are listening to the show are trying to do. But now the way that the society is constructed, you're not supposed to find community in stepping out of that. Mm. We're doing it anyway. Yeah. But the society doesn't want you to find community in stepping out from the story it's telling. And so it's harder for us to find each other and then build. I mean, yeah, that's that's why we're here. Right. Like that's that is yeah. the that's the mission here is like, let's be the community for when people want to step out of that. Mm -hmm. But but mm -hmm. but even then, like we're finding one way to step out. None of us has like fully stepped out of all of the exploitative systems. We are all still living on stolen land. We are all still watching the planet burn. You know, I tried I try to find ways to step out where I can. But it is um, you can sort of like only pick so many battles, too. Yeah. I mean, you talk about how in the book I'm sort of reflecting on things that I think I did wrong. And I was wrong about the things that were happening to me actually having much more to do with racism than I expected. But that wasn't me doing things wrong. Yeah. What I was actually doing things wrong was when I was teaching those first several years. Now, look, every teacher when it's young, they make mistakes and so forth. But the ideologies that I was espousing, you know, about what was wrong with their English. This is what I, I didn't have hardly any training. And the fact that I was able to get that job without much training is another thing I talk about in the book. But anyway, I really did connect with the students. I was good at that. Like I was actually really good at connecting with them. That's why I stayed in education. But I still was just thinking of the way that they and other Koreans spoke English is wrong. 
as opposed to the way that they need to communicate. Right. My friends and I, when we were there, it was a common thing to sort of laugh at the street signs there because it was always like just slightly off English and the signs and so forth. And like legitimately, some of those things, the way that the things get messed up, like it just, it's, it looks like another word and you, you laugh and all that. But when you, when we talked about it more and like now with the perspective I have, I'm realizing that, you know, we were doing some of this stuff to justify our presence there. I say this in the book specifically, if the adults can't make the right street science, then we really need to help these kids speak English the right way. Right. With all the air quotes around right on, on right. throughout. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. right. And I can't go back and undo that, you know? Right. So I am hoping that all groups of people, language educators, but anyone involved in education, um, and as you say, it's really only the middle part that's about language education. It's right. just like the first third is all this other stuff. And then there's this language part. And then yeah. there's back back to the other stuff. Now what do we do about it? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. So. Th- I mean, the, t- the tie to language feels so powerful because of the way you kind of set it up. And we talked about formation of blackness and whiteness, about the formation of ideas around ability and disability. And then we, we get into this idea about about language and kind of standard English and or what you refer to as standardized, you know, kind of putting the the emphasis on the intentionality around creating this. And the the tool is slightly different, but it seems like the the effect is the same, right? Where there are these ways that we are trying to replicate hierarchy, whether it's what your skin tone is, whether it's your kind of ability or disability status, and then, you know, how you talk. I mean, now that you say it, it's like, obviously, we judge people on how they talk immediately. There's, you know, code switching, the ways that people present themselves, how they, what type of language they use is obviously indicators for social status. But I don't know that I had tied it as directly to whiteness in my mind. Can you help, you know, help us make that link? Yeah, I don't really just want to write this book for language teachers, right? I wanted to appeal to people who aren't just literally language teachers. And the reason I bring that up is because I think that this is a a connection, an avenue, I guess, that should be outside of the little language space. I mean, this goes to sort of the idea of racial linguistic ideologies, which is not my idea. Uh, This is Flores and Rosa. But talking about how race and language are co-constructed. So the body that the language is coming out of matters in the way that the language is perceived. And then and vice versa, that when the language comes out of the right person, then like the language also gains extra power. So this is how you'll get less qualified English teachers in a lot of foreign countries making a lot more money than much more qualified teachers of color because in a lot of places that are hiring teachers, they, you know, simply associate a certain look with the right English and English right. skills, right? Now, now that's within the language field, but like you can see that if you look at actual like English teaching and you can see it with the way that professional norms around writing exclude lots of different forms of English. And so, you know, all of these things that people probably think are just about language themselves, or they might think it's racist, depending on what the thing is, but they're still not quite crisscrossing race and language in their head. You know, the point that Flores and Rosa and many other scholars have made and that I'm piggybacking on with that connection is that um, there is no disembodied language, right? Right. It's not like there's a version of English that just lives in the dictionary all by itself that various people try to use, that who is using the language is always a, like, integral part of of how how communication happens. Well, right, because if, if it's just the dictionary, then you're ignoring who put it in the dictionary. Right. And what they wanted it to represent when it was put there and what wasn't put in the dictionary or hasn't yet been put in the dictionary. I think one of the things that people get hung up on when I talk about these things is that they say, well, 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 you're just not going to teach English? Um, And (laughs) because (laughs) this is what they say, you know, they're like, well, well, there would be no rules. Now would you understand each other? Exactly. I hear that. (laughs) Just like, all right, calm down. I didn't say don't teach English. No, what I've said, and I say this a bunch of times, is like, 
teach the English that the students are likely to speak. You know, if they are in New York, teach them the English that they're going to hear in their community. It's, it's not like the teaching of English is how we came to understand each other. Right. Right. Like the right. fear that if we don't teach English, we won't understand each other ignores the fact that for many, many, many thousands of years prior to teaching English, we still found a way to understand each other. Yeah. The teaching English is just supposed to accelerate the, the, the learning that's probably going to happen anyway. I don't want people to think that I'm saying don't teach the language. I think that I'm saying both that the way we use the language is really important. Like we have to be careful when we're using Certain words, like I've talked a few times about how, like, ability to function in society is used, like, in, like, official documents. And you're like, but what what does that mean? Right. <laughs> like, how did that get there? Right. And why is it your inability to function in the society and not society's inability to function with you in it? Right. You know, and, and so I'm saying both that the way we use the language is important and also on the other side, the way that we teach the language is just following all of the same ideologies of the rest of the things we do, unless we recognize that and actually challenge it in our work. Because I'm not saying don't teach. I'm saying, like, we just really have to think carefully, and this is for language teaching, but it's for teaching in general, carefully about the way we are either upholding power or distributing it or whatever it is. There's going to be some power in that classroom. We can all pretend that the teacher doesn't have any power, and that's just foolish. Because, uh, you, you know, like, we, we you have some power in that room, um, and the way you use it in, is important. So ask people to think about that. There's a, I, I feel like there's a tension in this this feels like a really kind of great example of it. And it's not the only one, but I think about this a lot as like the, we want to create a different world. So we want to create a system where kids can like live into and then create a different world and kids have to live in the current world. And it feels like, you know, this idea of kind of like standardized English is, is a great example of this. Like, like, you know, sort of fundamentally language is about communication. Your, you know, Korean students, we're able to communicate just fine. That doesn't make their language wrong. There's a like world that we would like to create, which I think is actually like a much richer, more vibrant, you know, more creative place, which is that everybody is able to communicate in whatever way kind of suits them best. And we are all able to accept that and hear that. And I think we're probably all richer for it. And we don't live in that world yet. And, and so as you're thinking about students and teaching them English, like there is a value, like you, your ability to function in the academic space is tied to your ability to, you know, I think you talk about early in the introduction of the book about like you are, you are very fluent and comfortable in standardized English. You may choose not to use it sometimes, but you're like access to that is, is part of a thing that gives you access to education, access to power, access to, you know, sort of elite spaces you know, how how do we both create a world in which we don't need that hierarchy that is baked into language, but also like set kids up to be successful in the world they currently live in? Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of the, the, the existential question about everything, isn't it? Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the big question, man. Um, <laughs> I mean, I tried to give pra- pragmatic advice towards the end both for language and then towards, like, white readers in general. And what I tried to do was give advice that is, I want to say, straightforward but challenging. Mm-hmm. Like, I, we talked last time about checklists. Like, I don't like making lists like that. Right. But if you look carefully at what I wrote after each list item, it's like a whole paragraph of, like, stuff to do. And... All of those things are going to take a lot of work and planning. I try to give advice that people who are working in the field can take with them and actually act upon. And, you know, the same thing for the advice I give to white readers at the end. Like, none of them are things that are just going to be easy, but it's also not supposed to be easy. Right. And it's not supposed to be fast. And my advice for how to balance that with the reality of what's happening now and how to like get on from day to day. I just think people should just do the best they can while they keep plugging at this, but they have to not stop. Yeah. But I, you know, I mean, think about like your Korean students, there's a version of 
encouraging them and giving them the kind of confidence boost that they might need to feel good about expressing themselves in a way that is effective, but maybe not quote unquote correct. And, and they probably feel good about that. And if they then want to come and get a job in the United States, are like, are their mm-hmm. options limited? Because, you know, there, there is the expectation of standardized language. Well, I try to acknowledge that. And mm-hmm. I say, you know, standardized English isn't really going anywhere. I'm not even saying we should get rid of standardized English. I'm saying we just need to contextualize it correctly. Mm-hmm. And I think it can be taught effectively if it was called standardized English when you take the class. I mean, obviously just changing the name is not, you know, enough because people love to just change the name of things. They don't do anything. Mm-hmm. But but I mean, by, by classifying it as standardized English, it simply becomes a class like some other school subject. And it's just something people are learning. Right. But it's not supposed to be reflective of what is ideal in their society. Right. Because it, it, as a former, former English teacher, like when I didn't teach standardized English, it felt like we were breaking the rules or when I let kids, you know, just be themselves, it felt like we were breaking the rules and we did have to have explicit conversations about the times in which we have to use certain types of speech. Right. And I think naming that honors however people show up, right. Like, which we should affirm anyway. So yeah, that's dope. Yeah, and there's a way that if you put the context around it, then you can start to take some of the like unearned value away from it, right? It's it's here is like one way to communicate. It is not the right way. It is not the way by which we should judge the value of somebody, but rather it is you know one one tool in our arsenal of communication. I um I mentioned in there that you could call it model English because you know it's like a model home because like nobody actually uses it. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so yep. I think that a lot of the power in all of these hierarchies comes from either them not being named or them having chosen the names themselves. Right. Yeah. Just changing the name of something doesn't mean anything, but it do, it is a good place to start and sort of calling attention. I mean, I appreciate the language you use in the book and, you know, not standard English, but standardized English. And then your podcast, which which we haven't talked about yet, but um, is a good time as any to plug, which is unstandardized English. Where where does that title come from and why should people listen to the podcast? Well, I started the podcast long before I got the book sorted out, right? So I was thinking of what to call my my podcast, which had a much narrower focus back then. Like it was very specifically about, I was going to take one word and talk about its like connections to race uh, that were often not spoken of. Like the first episode was about expats and, and immigrants, right? I mean the same thing, but, <laughs> right. but, but, you understand. They don't mean the same uh, thing. right? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So, but then I lost focus because, like I said, I, I have ADHD. So <laughs> a couple of episodes in, I didn't focus and I was off talking about some other stuff. Um, so, but I kept the name of the, of the, of the, of the podcast as Unstandardized English because I still technically speak about language a lot of the time. But I just, I tend to use language as an entry point into analyzing other things. Yeah, people should definitely check out your podcast and knowing that you just finished this book, this dissertation, you must have lots of time on your hands. What have you been thinking about? When I really did get to stop and think, I thought about my family. I, like, I thought back. You know, you get a million like ancestry ads like in your email. I, I, took, I took it. <laughs> I actually did it this time. And, you know, I said, let me follow the thread back to where it, it's like I would have to pay, basically. <laughs> right? Like, just follow until the free records stop. Yep. And I found out that, like, the records for my family stopped in one town in South Carolina. And I was thinking about that. I was thinking about how the first several census that they show up on, it's just, like, illiterate labor. Mm. And so I just thought about that and just thinking about how that's probably all they were allowed to ever be. And I, you know, thought specifically, because it's a degree that's tied to education, that... I wondered where where it would take me, and I wonder what they would think of it. Um, talk a little bit about about your son. 
you started the the Ezel project on the time he was born. You mentioned it last time. He is now no longer a tiny baby. Um, tell us tell us about Ezel in the world you you hope to be part of creating for him. Ezel, yeah, he's you know he's really he's really a person now. You know, like back then I was I I really had no idea what he would really be like. I mean, he was months old. He starting to have a little personality. <laughs> so you know, I mean, it's it's just it's it's really interesting to see. I hadn't hardly had any interaction with other parents when I was on here last because it was 2020. And now in these two years, because he's been at daycare for about a year and a little bit now, and just being on playgrounds and he'll actually somewhat play with other kids now. So you talk to other parents and like, yeah, I, the, the little kids, the little, little kids, like they may notice skin color because we've right. studies from however many months old, right? They notice, but they're not seeing the stuff they've been taught yet. But you hear stuff from these parents, man. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's all the type of stuff that I wouldn't have recognized as being tied to race when I was younger. You know, the stuff, the assumptions, the, mm-hmm. you know, the good schools, the, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. And we're like, he's two, you know, but yeah. we're two and a half. I wish there were at the time that that didn't matter. And my conversations as a parent with other parent, but it's always present. And I'm thankful for parents like Andrew who can talk to me honestly about these things and give me the scoop. Um, Because I don't know that I, you know, you say good schools, Andrew. And if I said good schools back in the day, like we would have meant totally different things. And I think sometimes we still do, right? Like what constitutes a good school for my brown kid, you know? So um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for elevating that. I had some friends who, I guess I'm not really surprised in retrospect from what I know about them, but they, they talked a big game, you know, 2020. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, they moved to like, it's really hard to get as white as the area they moved to in the New York area uh, for the schools. That's why with what I'm saying with, with all this stuff, it's like, it's really important how people live. Right. Not just what they, what they say, you know. It's much easier to say the right stuff. It is. As you think about the world that you, you know, want to be part of creating for, for your son, you went all the way back to, as far as the free version of Ancestry.com would take you um, in, in, your, in your lineage. And then, and, you know, sort of thinking about, about him, if, you know, whatever, however many generations later, somebody's looking back on kind of this part of your family's you know, trajectory, what, are, what, do you, what do you hope they see? What do you hope kind of comes of that? Oh, yeah, that's, that's why I've been thinking about this since I graduated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm the first doctor. That, mm-hmm. I, that I found on there. I'm just specifically speaking of the people with my last name, right? Right. I just thought that was cool. I um, I didn't really get to soak in feeling like I succeeded because I, I was just so busy until the summer and just a whole bunch of nights when I got to just really think about exactly what you're just asking me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just hope that however many people buy this book, that it uh, just stays in a few shelves um, and if anyone reads it and they do decide they want to challenge things a little bit in the field, then I feel like that'll be something that a few generations down the lines yeah. on whatever future version of ancestry we're on from under the water. Um, they, <laughs> they, uh, yep. they're able to find what their, you know, land-based ancestor was all about. So. <laughs> he didn't even have gills. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's a very important, <laughs> very important point. Yeah. Well, I mean, the book, you know, you, you talk about it in terms of the field of English language teaching. I know it is ostensibly written for that. It is called Antisocial Language Teaching, English and the Pervasive Pathology of Whiteness. But it is certainly I don't I've never taught English. Um, I've never taught anything. I'm not. I'm not in education. You teach all the time, um, oh, Andrew. Thank you, Val. I, I feel like I set yeah. you, I lobbed that one over the plate for you. To, <laughs> um, but, but I just, I got so much out of it. You definitely don't have to be in the field of education to come away with a deeper understanding of kind of how we got to where we are and how to get to a potentially better place. So I think it's, it's really a great contribution. I'm grateful you wrote it and grateful you came back on the show. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. I was glad to be here and I'm glad you enjoyed it because I don't know. Sort of, I wrote that thing with my whole chest. So <laughs> hopefully, it, re- it reads hopefully. that way for sure. For sure, it definitely reads it like you wrote it with your whole chest. Yeah, <laughs> yep. for sure. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.
So, Val, what did you think? Yeah, so I, I really want to dig into this pyramid scheme idea because I just, I'm fascinated by it. And I think a lot of what I see in it is a search for people to find some community. Mm-hmm. And so the idea that whiteness serves as that just really struck me. Yeah. So give me all the white insights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think that need for community, the need to feel like you belong is is really powerful. And this idea that it, it starts out as maybe there is something, but pretty soon, like you just belong to it for the sake of it. Right. That, that like really mm. what you are into is the community and the product sort of becomes secondary. I'm I'm not sure what whiteness was originally selling that was real because mm. I don't think there's ever been been anything like real tied behind whiteness. But this idea that if you kind of question it, if you look at it too closely and you say, wait, we're not actually selling anything here, that so much of your kind of not only self-identity, but also community starts to fall apart. Yeah, it's interesting. I do think they were selling something real. It was the the treatment of black and brown and other d- folks, right? So mm. they were selling that you wouldn't get treated this way right? if you came into the whiteness fold. And so I do think it was a very real thing they were trying to convince people to buy into. And I still wonder now why it works in 2022, right? Yeah. Like, how is that still so effective? And Dr. Gerald talks about how language plays a role in communicating these ideas mm-hmm. in a way that if we aren't thoughtful and interrogate the things that we we say, um, how we're using language to exclude or include, mm-hmm. to promote some folks who are better at, quote, standardized language than others, how we treat people who might not have the, the same vocabulary. And so we do all play a role in this whiteness pyramid scheme. And sometimes even as people of color who also don't want that feeling of isolation or separation, or you just need just access to things that the language, being able to engage in the standardized language allows you to achieve. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your your relationship to standardized English. I mentioned that, you know, whenever I didn't teach standardized English, I felt like I was breaking the rules. Um, And I have this, this weird relationship probably with code switching. I don't know that I do it a whole lot, hopefully not a whole lot, but I I am sure I am modeling to my young people how to do that in an instance where I feel like it is in their best interest for safety reasons. Um, and I hate it. I hate feeling that way. Yeah. Like what's lost in that? Like I, I, I see that the need. And I feel like I come up against this in all sorts of realms and we sort of got into it a little bit in the episode, but like there, there is the world that we would like to create. And then there's the world we live mm-hmm. in. And like, you mm-hmm. know, I think the way that we judge school quality based solely on test scores is bad. And mm-hmm. I think that your ability to do well on a test in this moment, as much as I think that shouldn't be a gateway to access, mm-hmm. you know, to opportunities in many ways it is. And so you know, we can say, well, like standardized tests don't determine how valuable a person is. And I believe that. And if we don't ever teach kids how to take standardized tests, there's like a world of opportunity that gets closed off. Like mm-hmm. wh- what's lost in forcing people into the box of standardized English? What's lost when you feel the need to go to your neighbor and and kind of present a, you know, more like palatable version of mm-hmm. yourself to your neighbor for safety's sake? I mean, I don't understand. I can imagine the need for that. Mm -hmm. And it feels like there's something that that gets lost in that. There's like a part of you that's not allowed to show up or something. Yeah. I I was in a conversation this weekend with a friend and a colleague. He just got his doctorate. He studied black teachers at a historically black high school locally that um, after desegregation was closed but one thing that that came up in his his conversations with the alumni he interviewed is that many of the teachers did not have to because of Jim Crow did not have to engage with white folks on the same level that integration required people who came after them mm. to deal with them right mm-hmm. so in most instances black communities were pretty isolated you had all your businesses and everything else like right you only interacted with white folks 
on rare occasions that you like worked for them, you, you weren't visiting the same places. And, and right. my grandmother said the same thing. I remember asking her once, I was like, so talk to me how you dealt with racism. She was like, I, <laughs> we didn't, we weren't around a lot of white people. Like it just right. was not a thing. And so teachers in that time to prepare black students for integration had to teach them this language and how to access this particular piece of communication and and power in order to just survive right. right and it was a it was a both and situation like yes you are fully whole here and when you go out into the world i'm going to need you for your survival mm. for your hopeful thriving to be able to operate in this space as well and so it it does feel like a tricky place to be for our young people. I want for the future, for our, our folks to be better than we have been, whatever that mm-hmm. means. And I think that's probably why I'm struggling with like a measure, right? So I don't right. know that it's, I don't know that it's measured in how well they write a formal essay or how well they communicate on a podcast or whatever. I, I don't know that it's that but I want them to be better than what we have been. So how can we make space for our young people to be better without like putting them in a, in a box? And I don't know that it's as simple as saying, here, you can speak this way amongst your friends and that you have to speak this way at work. Because I imagine a workplace where young people, all people can show up and we can make strides to understand each other better versus like, trying to put them in the standardized way of being. And I mean, my guess would be is that that workplace is a better workplace. Yeah. You know, like people are more fully themselves. People are able to show up. They're able to be, you know, present in ways that they wouldn't otherwise. And you get more rich, you know, like all the reasons that every, and I, I think I go back a little bit to Dr. Clark, you know, in this like mosaic versus melting pot idea where like mm-hmm. standardized English is sort of the melting pot. I mean, it's not really, it's like, it's like the melting pot that is then strained and filtered and you know, <laughs> right. died, died right. more white along the way. But like, there's a way in which the, this, you know, standardized English is sort of forcing conformity is forcing people to melt together. And there's a way mm-hmm. in which a mosaic that allows all sorts of different, I think about like the loss of, you know, we talked to Dr. Faircloth mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. the loss of native languages and, right. and what sort of like ideas and concepts and, ways of making sense of the world get lost when we lose a language. We yeah. we suffer the same fate, I think, when we force everyone to communicate in the same way. And you look yeah. at small communities, I, mean, I think even about like, you know, middle school kids, when they talk to each other, have what feels sometimes like code language. You're like, I have no idea what yeah. you're talking about. But yeah. it allows a deeper, more meaningful form of connection between them. And And so... We we need to find a way to communicate with each other. I think people are pretty good at finding ways to communicate. It's what we've been doing since there have been people. And mm-hmm. can can we sort of take some of the stigma out of different ways of communicating in order to allow, allow that to kind of flourish? And, and what does that look like? Yeah. And I, I think we have to be honest about the violence that was required to establish the standardized language. Like this wasn't a, Mm -hmm. Hey, we want to invite you all into this language that we can all share. No, it was beat out of people or beat into people. Right. And so, you know, when we talk about power and how our standardized language came to be, it wasn't because people weren't fighting to keep their own ways of expression. right? Right. And so the future that I imagine, like it forces us to, to open up to the possibilities Whenever I have a chance to, and it's usually through some form of some form of media, book, or a movie or text, to just even have a glimpse of a, a culture that I am not a part of, like my heart expands. I'm like, yeah. oh man, what a beautiful way to think about this thing that I yeah. just never could have imagined because I don't have the language, you know, right. for that. Right. But other people do. And, um, I think that's, I think that's really incredible and powerful. And we, we miss out on a lot if we, if we force this standardized language, um, I don't have all the answers. I don't, what does that mean for tests? I don't know. We'll figure it out. Like you said, right. we've been figuring it out. Yeah. Figure it out. But I think it'll push us to think about what's more important. And it's these beautiful ideas that people have not, how neatly they're packaged in a standardized way. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I, lo- I love that. Like Dr. Gerald said, like, right, it's not, the answer is not that we don't teach anybody any of the rules of the English language or, you know, spelling or grammar or any of those things, but it, but mm-hmm. it's about removing some of the stigma around alternate mm-hmm. forms of communication, ways that people have been communicating forever that don't fit neatly into this box and yeah. and recognizing this, this, you know, kind of standardized version of English as just one potential tool for communication in sort of the the toolbox of of communication and and there may be times where it's appropriate and hopefully we find more times where where that is not appropriate but there are also other times where other forms of communication are are more appropriate or more effective yeah for sure and to to be open to those i think that's really important yeah because i am sure i've unintentionally judged someone who didn't communicate in a way that i did yeah And this is, I'm not even talking about language per se, but just any expression, right? I'm like, hey, this is how I want to, I want to graphically draw this idea versus someone who decides to write it out in the written word. Mm -hmm. And so checking myself, this is, these are always checks on my my own heart. I hope, I hope listeners are feeling the same, right? They're always like checking their own hearts. And, you know, when you brought up the young people example, sometimes I have no idea what my kids are talking about, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but being open to understanding that. That way of communicating is really meaningful for them. Right. They have something to teach me. And hopefully, you know, they understand that I have something to teach them as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because that, right, it facilitates more efficient communication between them. They communicate ideas better with each other, which allows them not only to, you know, kind of get ideas across more quickly, but also I think that particularly when it is not standardized, creates a sense of community. We yeah. are speaking yeah. this kind of thing, so we are on the inside. And I think there's a way in which probably standardized whiteness, standard, well, mm. there's some Freud. <laughs> yeah, there St- is. Standardized English is, you know, is this kind of like we we are part of the club. We are, we mm. are, we are on the inside. Oh. Oh, yeah. Right. And and oh. so the ability to use it is like the is like the, the code oh. word is like the gateway into Dang. this this club. Dang. Dang, that doggone pyramid got me. <laughs> I do feel like sometimes, okay, oh, this is this is upsetting. This is upsetting to me, listeners, where I'm like, okay, I know how to speak this language, so I am part of the club, but I also don't want to be part of the club in that way. Mm. But I know I have I can be right. if I wanted to. And I use it when I have to. Right. I don't like that. Yeah. It makes me feel gross. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. And I think there's, there, but there's like, there's a way in which the more spaces you have access to because of that, the more you can push those spaces to, to not focus on that so much. The more you can like bring That's your, my hope. bring that access to then open up the door for other people. But yeah, my hope is that it's, it's a bridge in some way. Yeah. Well, it was a rich conversation for sure. Um, here we are, the action step portion of the episode, Val, yeah. as we are doing this season. What action steps are you left with out of this conversation with Dr. Gerald? Yeah, my action steps include like checking how I'm responding, you know, like my internal responses to different forms of, of language expression, having some wonderings about kind of what I'm feeling about it. And specifically with my young people, trying not to to force them in a box, but as an adult, like push on that box that they are all in <laughs> so yeah. that it makes more space for them. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I think for me, which I feel like is probably our, our action step in just about every episode, but it's like whatever the conversations that I'm going to have with my kids out of this. Yeah. And one of them, I think, is I'm sort of constantly thinking about how do I make sure they are aware of the privilege that they have without it like crippling them or without making them feel bad about it, you know? Um, mm-hmm. But I think this, the access to standardized English is something that, that will come relatively easy to them that they have been exposed to for, for a long time and, and helping them be aware of the way that that is a privilege. And yes. so, you know, mm-hmm. h- helping to kind of destigmatize the ways in which people communicate that are maybe don't fall into this kind of standardized bucket and, and help them see the ways in which their access to that is one of the Mm. Um, privileges that they walk around the world with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, I want to make sure that I'm using this this ability to talk <laughs> talk for good. Yeah, that's hard. I never want to get too comfortable. Mm. I never want to mm. get too comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think my other action step out of this is is recognizing the moments where my access to language 
makes me comfortable. Yeah. And kind of trying to be aware of those and, and think about what what voices might be getting lost in that moment, what ideas might be getting lost in those moments. It's comfort with the, the, the standardized whiteness as you Freudian slips there. <laughs> Your comfort level with that, one's comfort level with that, by default, makes you less fluent or less comfortable with other forms of expression. Mm, mm-hmm. And I think that's where like the judgment and the biases kind of pop up. And so how do I continue to, to challenge myself to make sure that I'm not like sitting in that comfort? Yeah, that that is huge. And I think in a conversation with people who have different forms of communication, different you know ability to bring ideas out in different ways, when your desire is really to hear somebody, to hear the ideas mm-hmm. they're they're saying in a group setting, The ideas that are easier to understand are the ideas that you're gravitating towards, Mm. right? The ideas Mm. that you're like, oh, yeah, I get that right away because of the way you presented that are the the ones that then get elevated Mm. in the space. And so thinking about how do we create spaces where where we can push back on that, where we can hold off on that and say, wait a minute, there's another idea in here that's not being communicated in quite the same way, but that doesn't mean it's less valuable. And that's why in our PTA meetings, voices might not get heard, even though someone is communicating, like they are letting you know what they need and want, but because it is different from the standardized language or whiteness, we ignore those yep and you know you might be uncertain with communicating with someone who communicates outside of like the standardized way right right and then that makes it feel really awkward and strange Mm -hmm. and you're like i don't know if i'm gonna say the right thing or if i'm gonna say the wrong thing um instead of like being fully present to what they have to offer right one also loses you know, when they're in their head about that, thinking like, there's no way we can connect because we don't speak the same language. Right. Yeah. Then I like the, the draw is either to just shut it down. This is mm-hmm. awkward. This doesn't work, whatever. Or the other, the like the, the danger on the other side, I think, is is then you like fall into imitation in, mm. in a way that is like, you know, kind of code switching for bad, right? Like, yeah. oh, yeah. well, let me just try to talk like you. And now Please you're not don't. bringing your full, your full, <laughs> your right. full authentic self to the, to right. the conversation. Right? I love it when white people are just white. Just be white. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. You don't have right. to like call right. me child. Hey, child or whatever. I don't I'd like, no, 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 no. Just be white. It's yeah. fine. Yes. Well, my other suggested action step for listeners is to buy the book. My other action step is listen to this podcast. Yeah. Think about it. Think about how language and power and whiteness is showing up for you. I will say that in my conversation with you, friend, I was able to to elevate some ideas that I could not have received on my own. So I want mm. to thank you for being in conversation with me weekly about these topics. Oh, well, thank you, Val. I totally yeah. feel the same way. That is the, the the true gift of these conversations for me as well, is the different perspectives and the ability to surface things. I certainly see things in a new light every time we talk, and I'm grateful for that. So. For sure. And if you are grateful for it, listeners, getting to be a little piece of these conversations, we would be grateful for your support. Patreon.com slash Integrated Schools. Come and join us. Come meet us up for a happy hour. Check out the facilitation questions. Ooh. Throw us a few dollars every month to help keep making this podcast. We'd be very grateful. Yes. Thank you so much. Also, share it with your friends. Listen, share, talk about it. Make sure people know uh, the good things that are happening on this podcast and in your yes. life. Well, it's a pleasure, as always, Val, to be in this with you. Because I try to know better and do better. Until next time. Welcome to the Great Schools Pod. <laughs> That's like Hello, your first you. mess up ever. Never, for real. What, what You've never messed you've never messed like, it up. Like,